So we are in this Sermon on the Mount. I mentioned last week that I had a pastor tell me uh, as we began this sermon series that they never preached the Sermon on the Mount, that um, it was uh, too depressing, um, didn't have uh, uplifting love, and um, I, I beg to kind of differ with them. I think there's some, some great great things that we can learn. Uh, I will tell you that um, the Sermon on the Mount is something of a self-examination. So as we spend these weeks going through chapters uh, of Matthew 5, 6, and 7, uh, I would encourage you to use this as a time to examine uh, where you're at in walk with your walk with the Lord. So our culture embraces entertainment, it pursues all types of pleasure, and our culture and society will tell you that if you want to be happy, just embrace what we embrace, what we think is right and good and happy. Most of our society today would tell us sorrow and pain and self-examination may not have a place in that happiness mode. In fact, we often, when pain and sorrow comes, we try to lighten it. We, we even say something like, you know, really lighthearted to lighten the moment when sorrow or pain comes in our life. It's almost like our mantra in our society is blessed are those who laugh their way through life. Now, none of us like sorrow. None of us like to feel pain. If we are all honest, whether we are outside in the lost world or we're a part of the family of God, all of us would say that we do not like pain or heartache or sickness or disease. We do not like stress. We do not like loss. If we're really honest, we don't want to deal with any of that. In fact, we would probably just agree with King Solomon in Proverbs 14, 13, when he says, Even in laughter the heart may ache and joy may end in grief. So, what we think is sad those times that we are pressured, times that we are stressed, we certainly wouldn't say that that is a path to happiness. That's a path that we really want to take. Rejoicing ends in mourning. Happiness ends in sadness. In our day-to-day living, that would just be absurd that we would even think that way. Most of us are, are, are structured to think that happiness brings bliss, and it doesn't matter whether we are sophisticated or primitive in our thought, whether we are rich or poor, whether we are educated or uneducated, it doesn't matter. There is no debate on the negative side. We want to avoid pain and suffering and disappointment and frustrations and hardships and all of those other things that we consider bringing unhappiness. In fact, throughout history, the standard of the world has been favorable brings happiness, unfavorable brings unhappiness. But you know, Jesus came along and Jesus just turned so many things upside down. He reversed the path in many cases And we come to this verse in the Beatitudes, this second Beatitude in verse 4. And we hear Jesus say, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. A statement that's rather paradoxical, don't you think? Jesus is saying, happy are those who are unhappy. There's gladness and sadness. 
Well, we're going to take a look at that this morning. But first, let me pray. Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, for you are our strength and our redeemer. I pray, Father, that you would illuminate our hearts and minds this morning for what you hold for us through this, your holy word. I pray this in your name. Amen. So in continuing this sermon series, you remember last week we talked about verse 3. In verse 3, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And we talked about what it meant to be blessed. That word means in the Greek, happy, approved, to have favor with God. And so we talked about what that means and what it means to be poor in spirit. And it's not about being physically poor, but it's about spiritually poor, taking a look at yourself, coming to the end of yourself. I said last week that we had to surrender all, even to the point of spiritually being destitute, realizing that we have nothing, we are nothing, we can bring nothing to the equation. We have to be total in our surrender to God. And so as much as poor in spirit is opposite of the wisdom today, so is this thought of happiness being connected with mourning. And so there are many experiences that we have in pain, in loss, as we grieve and mourn in this world. Think about it. So as we get older, in fact, it really doesn't matter about age. I was thinking about Emma being over in England these two weeks, and the reason someone said, well, uh, why did Terry go if it was a school trip? And uh, there were many chaperones, but that's not why Terry went with Emma to England. She went with her because we both felt very uncomfortable with her being away for two weeks with her disease. If something happened in England, I wanted one of us to be there with her. And so age is not a factor. We think it is. You know, my joints are a little bit tougher than they were at uh, maybe 25 at 64. Um, and yes, that 65th birthday, man, it is rapidly coming. I mean, it's just a few months away. And, um, and I can feel it. But we, we think about our health. We worry about the future uh, and, and regardless of age. And it's loss. It's lost to us. It, it stresses us in ways, in relationships. Think about the loss we experience in relationship when it comes to some in divorce and some where their children leave home. We've experienced that eight out of nine times, and we've got one more to go when they leave home and how that feels with that empty nest. It's a mourning that takes place as they leave. But probably one of the greatest mournings or grieving that we have is when we lose a loved one. Um, all of us in some way have experienced that in losing a family member, a husband or wife, a child, a grandchild, a grandmother or great-grandmother, a friend, a neighbor. We have all experienced those losses in our life, and, and we grieve that loss. We understand that loss. And as believers, we believe what the Hebrew writer tells us, that in that loss, Christ is with us. He comforts us because the Hebrew writer says, there is nothing that we have experienced that God, that Jesus has not experienced. He is he has gone through. He sympathizes with us because he has gone through the things of this world. And so there is a comfort that comes in that loss. But that is not what Jesus is talking about here. He's not talking about the human loss that we experience. He's not talking. Yes, he comforts us. He's there with us. But here he is talking about blessed are those who mourn their sinfulness. Jesus is speaking about godly sorrow. He is speaking about godly mourning. He is speaking about that desire in us that we recognize that we are sinful. You see why nobody wants to preach this? A lot of people don't want to preach because it's tough to hear 
when I stand up and I'm pointing to myself, we are sinful people, and we have to recognize that. And Jesus is flowing through here. Remember last week I said that these things aren't happenstances. He puts these together. They flow together. So you are poor in spirit. You come to the end of yourself. You recognize the bankruptcy that you have in your spirit. And you plead for God's mercy and grace as he calls you to himself so that you can enter the kingdom of heaven. And then Jesus says, and not only are you to be spiritually in poverty, but that's to lead to godly sorrow. The poor in spirit is to lead us to mourning, to remember, to remember who we are and whose we are. King David understood that. King David understood the great sin that he had when it came to Bathsheba and Uriah. David repented and expressed his sorrow. We know Psalm 51 very well. Verse 3 and 4 says, For I know my transgressions, my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only have I sinned and done what is evil in thy sight. The Apostle Paul grieved over his sinful condition. In Romans 7, 24, he says, Oh, what a miserable person I am who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death. This is the Apostle Paul. Now, he goes on to talk about the person who is the one who frees him, the one who saves him. James in 4, 9 says, let there be tears for what I have done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter and gloom instead of joy. Nine times in these scriptures does this word sorrow, mourning, come in the New Testament. And the word that is used these nine times has a different context. But here, the word that is used in Matthew's gospel, this word is the strongest expression in the Greek of this word mourning. It is severe. It carries a, a, an agony of the soul. It carries an inner deep expression. And whether we mourn or weep loudly outside or lament in our hearts, our sinful nature, our sinning against God. We know that God is present, that God is with us. David stopped, he stopped hiding his sin, and he began to mourn and confess. And then he declared, how blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit, Psalm 32. Happiness and blessedness does not come in mourning itself. It is a response acknowledging who we are and that God has forgiven us. Godly mourning brings godly forgiveness. It brings a godly happiness. It brings about a freedom that we would not have otherwise. Now, yes, we look at the world today, and the world will tell us all of these things come into a play of how we are happy. But mourning is not psychological. It's not even necessarily emotional. It is about the communion that we have with the living God who loves us as we respond and acknowledge who we are in his presence and our reality that divine forgiveness is a necessity. Jesus here would say, confess your sins and mourn, mourn, mourn. How often do we do that? How often do we do that? Godly mourning brings happiness 
and there is nothing, as the screen says, in human effort that can do that. God does that by our forgiveness, by forgiving us and bringing us into relationship with him. It is there that true happiness happens. Sin and happiness cannot exist together. Only mourners over sin are happy because only mourners over sin are forgiven. Until sin is forgiven and removed, happiness is locked out. Mourning over sin brings forgiveness of sin. It brings a freedom, a joy that passes understanding, Jesus would say. James, in the fourth chapter, verses 8 through 10, says, Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. And purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Sounds like something we want to do, right? Let your laughter be turned to mourning. Let your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord. But here's the kicker. Here's, Here's the great ending of this passage. And he will exalt you. He will lift you up. As you come to an understanding of who you are and whose you are, when you come to an understanding of repentance and forgiveness, you will be exalted and lifted up. You will have a freedom that enters you. True mourning over sin focuses on God. It focuses on what he has done through Jesus, his son. The attitude of forgiveness and reconciliation is a part of that freedom that we have in Jesus Christ. The mark of the mature life is not sinlessness. Now, are we to ascribe to, desire to live this sinless life? Absolutely. We're to strive for that, the apostle says. But this sinless life is going to come when we're face to face with God, when we are in heaven. Until then, the Apostle John warns us, if we say that we are without sin, we're deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1. And so, as forgiven children of God, joint heirs with the Father, joint heirs with the Son, we are to continually confess our sin. The results of godly mourning, Jesus says as he begins this sermon, is that we will be comforted, that we will be comforted through our coming to the end of ourself by acknowledging who we are. And as we continually mourn over sin, we are continually comforted. And it's not just a future comfort, it is a comfort now. We live into the comfort that God gives us through the power of the Holy Spirit now. God is not only bringing about future comfort as we come into his presence, but he is bringing about a comfort now. He brings comfort through grace and hope through the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. He brings comfort through his word as we study his word. Happiness comes to the Christian as we come to an understanding, as Jesus would say, come to me all who are heavy laden, weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He will lift the burden as we mourn over the sin that we have committed. So, yes, we have some mourning, some grief in this life from our experiences that sometimes just cave in around us, whether it's health or loss or relationship. And we're to, as Jesus would say, come to the end of ourself, recognizing our sin nature. But I think there's another piece 
that we ought to think about as we hear, blessed are the poor, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Over and over again in Scripture, we see that not only do people look at themselves as they come to Christ, but as they come to Christ, they begin to mourn over others that are lost or those who are in sin. And so we come to this place that the state of humanity, the state of our world, not to mention the church, is something that we mourn over. Over and over again, we have said, um, I've said from the pulpit, that um, our church is something that we need to be praying for. Not just our church, but the church. Over and over again, Paul prays for those that are helping him, those where he has planted churches. In Acts 20, verse 31, he is talking and praying for, talking about the elders in Ephesus. And he says, therefore, Luke tells us, therefore watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day. And here is the way he finishes that sentence, with tears. Paul says, as Luke records, I've been praying night and day for you with tears. I've been mourning for you with tears. John Knox carried a burden for Scotland. It says that he prayed day and night over Scotland, even to the point of where he was losing so much sleep that his wife went to him and said, John, you've got to stop this. You have to get some rest. You can't take this burden. And here's what was recorded in his journal from his wife's plea. How can I sleep when my land is not saved? Lord, give me Scotland or I die. A plea for others. Martin Lloyd-Jones and other scholars like John MacArthur and, and others have said, if the church doesn't begin to pray for the church today, what are we doing Aren't we going to pray that the Lord will move in such a way in our churches that the entire world would be felt, the entire world would experience what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ? MacArthur says we need to wake up. We need to weep over the condition of the church, of the world, and those around us, asking that they seek the living God. Are we? Do we mourn for those around us that are lost? Do we pray for others? Do we pray for the church? Do we pray for our world? I find it interesting that the Bible never tries to explain suffering, only that it's a part of a sin-filled world. But it does tell us how we can deal with suffering. Jesus says, in this world you have tribula tribulations, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. And so, we come to Jesus. When we experience suffering, when we experience pain, when we experience loss, when we are mourning and we come to Jesus, we understand that it is in Jesus that we will be comforted. It is in him that we will be blessed. In fact, it is in him that we find true happiness. All of the other things that we want to fill our life with are only temporary. They will go away. But for Jesus, it's always there. So how can we become godly mourners? Or how can we experience God's comfort? Well, I want to give you five things quickly that I think that we could learn from in how to experience this comfort through mourning. And the first is to eliminate the hindrances that we have. In other words, we have to acknowledge our sin. What is in our life that we are holding on to that we need to let go of? What is keeping us from being the person, the child of God, 
that God has asked us to be? What are those things? We, and, and so often we, we jettison many things that uh, as, as we get closer and we walk with Christ, we jettison many things, but there's that one thing maybe that we hold on to. God, you really don't want me to get rid of this for you, do you? But we need to remove the sin, the despair, the conceit, the pres- uh, procrastination, the pride that we have so that we become to a place where those hindrances are set aside and then we will understand who we are and whose we are and the comfort that only Christ can bring. Secondly, I believe that this comfort will be experienced by studying God's word. And here's why I say that. So many times as we read the Old and New Testament, what we hear are testimonies of those who have experienced hardship We can look at Moses, we can look at Job, we can look at David, uh, just many in the Old Testament. And we can go to the New Testament and look at those that have experienced loss and difficulty and hardship. If you go to Paul's testimony in Acts, and he just gives you this litany of stuff that he has experienced, and you think, this is the Apostle Paul? But he says through all of it, I can rejoice because Christ is with me. As we read scripture, as we study scripture, it gives us an understanding that God is with us, that he walks with us. The third is to pray. As we pray, as we spend time praying to the Lord, It is there that the Holy Spirit begins to work in us. As we listen and just stop in our prayer time and allow the Holy Spirit to minister us, it is there that the Holy Spirit will reveal those things to us that we do need to set aside and bring us into right relationship. The way to godly mourning is through prayer. And godly comfort comes through prayer. I've already mentioned this a little bit, but we need to realize that God is with us. As we can come to uh, faith in Jesus Christ, we have the indwelling Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is one that will convict us. It also will comfort us. And so as we come to faith and as we live in this faith with Jesus Christ, we hear that The Lord is close to us, to the brokenhearted. He rescues those whose spirit are crushed. Psalm 34, 18. God is aware of everything that we have and everything we're going through and all that we are experiencing. God is watching over us. Nothing escapes his eye. There's not a tear that we shed, a heartbreak that we feel that God doesn't understand and know. And the power of the Holy Spirit will help us walk through with us those times of mourning and bring us comfort. And then finally, um, and this is not an exhaustive list, this is just my list. Finally, we need to be and help each other, not go it alone. I was talking with Leslie before worship, and we were talking about the uh, things that have come out of the pandemic with with the church, and we were just not created to be alone. We were created for relationship, and we were created to be in relationship with one another. And when we are isolated and when we are alone, something happens. But when we are with one another and when we take on to help and comfort and be with and aid one another, it actually brings comfort to ourselves. In 2 Corinthians 1.4, Paul writes this. I want you to hear what he says. He says, He, capital H, He comforts us in all of our troubles so that, and you know that something important follows the so that, So he comforts us in all of our troubles. doesn't say some of our troubles. All of our troubles so that 
we can comfort others. That we can comfort others. When they are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. So when we acknowledge the comfort that God has given us and we begin to understand those around us, it leads us to wanting to help to be there to comfort others as God leads us. God comforts us and brings us through that morning to come and help someone else in their mourning, in their plight, whatever they are facing. God comforts us and gives us the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, not only to correct and help us, but for us to help others. And then the apostle in Romans 15, 13 says, Maybe, or may the God of hope fill you with all joy, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, your life and outlook may be a radiant hope. Be a radiant hope. Is your life a radiant hope to others? Are you living such that you are in communication, you're in relationship with others to help them as they live out their life? I really believe that part of the comfort that we find in serving God and being with God and even in our own trials and tribulations, we are aided in that comfort as we comfort others. Martin Lloyd-Jones, from his um, book that, um, on the Beatitudes, um, I want to give you this quote. Listen to what he says. He says, the Christian looks at the world, and even as he looks at himself, he is unhappy. He groans in the spirit. He knows something of the burden of sin as seen in the world, which was felt by the apostles and by the Lord himself. But he, immediately, he is immediately comforted. He knows, talking about the Christian. The Christian knows that there is glory coming. He knows there is a day that will dawn when, the Christ, when Christ will return and sins will, the sin will be banished from the earth. There will be a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. O oh, blessed hope. And he's right. There's going to be a day when there is no more sorrow, pain, suffering, no more disease, any of that. And that day is but a breath away for any of us. But folks, today is now. And God is with us now and present with us now. And anything that we are going through now, he is here. And Jesus says to us, blessed or happy are those who mourn. For they shall be comforted. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word, and I thank you for this verse. These first two Beatitudes have touched me and I hope that others have read and heard these in a way that your Holy Spirit is moving and touching them. Coming to an end of ourself, destitute, realizing I have nothing to offer you. Poor in spirit. Realizing, Father, that I am a sinful man. And it is only by your grace and mercy and your forgiveness that you've offered through my confession and repentance that I am comforted. It is in you, Father, that I have freedom. And I thank you for that. And so, Father, I pray this morning as we 
think about as your Holy Spirit begins to move in us again afresh as we think about this verse, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Father, that we would lean into you, hang on to you, acknowledge you in every way in our life. And it is then that this blessed happiness of whose we are and where we're going is going to flood us in a way that comforts regardless of what's around us or what we're going through. Thank you, Father, for your wonderful grace and mercy. We pray this in your holy name. Amen.